Okay, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, I'm really honoured to be giving this short introduction to the Tom Brock's first lecture on Women's Rugby League. And that's in recognition of the 101 anniversary of the first match um, played at the Sydney Showgrounds in 1921. Now, as some of you may know, I was recently involved in organising a mural in Redfern celebrating the star of this 1921 match, Maggie Maloney, who scored four tries and was dubbed the Delhi Messenger of the Blues. And tonight, I want to tell you why I felt it was important that this match and Maggie Maloney be remembered and what the memory of this match has to offer the women's game today. Sorry, I was expecting a podium. It's amazing how it makes you feel different when you don't have something in front of you. <laughs> You're quite exposed. Okay. Um, the British historian of women's soccer, Jean Williams, has observed that due to the fragmented history of the women's games in the football codes, the achievements of its early pioneers are lost to history, leaving women to become pioneers of their sport over and over again. And this has certainly been the case with women's rugby league. And I feel we need to rectify this situation because the story of the 1921 pioneers has much to give women in the game today. The 1921 pioneers, they were trailblazers on so many accounts. But the one that stands out for me is that they were truly the first embodiment of the passion, the ambition, the courage and commitment that we see in the women's game today, which is itself the result of many decades of passion, ambition, courage and commitment of women that I call the contemporary pioneers. And they've been at it from really the 1970s and 80s. And this actually can't be said for women's games in the other football codes. Before the advent of the 1921 New South Wales Ladies Rugby Football League, that's what they were called, most women's football matches in soccer and Australian rules were workplace charity matches. And some literally were kick and giggles in the park. But not so with Sydney's rugby girls, as they were dubbed. From the onset, they wanted to play on the same terms as the men, the same full tackle rules. They wanted to play to the same standard. They were adamant they were going to wear the same attire, jerseys, shorts and sprig boots. And most incredibly for this time, they had the same vision, which was to form their own competition in 1922, mirroring the New South Wales Rugby League's first grade men's competition. And the startling thing about this ambition is that it is pretty much the same vision, as I understand it, as the women who play in the NRL women's competition today, and which was also the long-held vision of the contemporary pioneers who got them there. And that's very special. And it brings continuity to this fragmented history of the women's game, to have a vision for the women's game that goes back over a century and is still current today, that is very special and it's special to rugby league. No podium. <laughs> okay, so how did the first pioneers go with this vision? Okay, this brings me to the second thing this story offers, which is inspiration. Women in the game can be really proud of their first pioneers and what they achieved. So many firsts. In 1921, women's sport was in its infancy. And for working class women, their options were basically tennis, swimming and the occasional workplace sports carnival. So to embark on rugby league at this period was truly trailblazing. And of course, it was controversial. Never before had women's sport attracted so much attention. The advent of the Ladies League was the biggest story full stop in Sydney in 1921. Over 200 references in local newspapers with the story also picked up throughout regional Australia and New Zealand and in turn inspired more women to pick up the codes in those places. But of course, a lot of this attention centred on whether or not the old chestnut of whether or not women should play rugby league. And the newspapers consulted everyone for their opinion. What does Annette Kellerman think? Oh, the Springboks are in town. What do they think? What do the doctors think? And of course, most of them thought they shouldn't do it or they ridiculed the notion. 
And as I'm sure you can imagine, the cartoonists in 1921 had an absolute field day. But this did not deter the rugby girls. Their inaugural match was the most highly promoted women's sporting event in Australian history at the time, and I sometimes wonder even the world. The promoter, Mick Simmons, a sports store still on George Street today, literally saturated the newspapers with advertisements for their inaugural match, which goes to show what good marketing and promotion will do. <laughs> the event of the year, as it was billed, attracted a crowd of 25 to 30,000 spectators, and that was a then record for a women's sporting event billed as the main attraction. And all this is lost to history because the women's game didn't survive. But here's the real inspiration, and that's how the first pioneers played. And just imagine what it must have been like for them, walking out onto the showgrounds to play their first public match of rugby league after all this controversy and ridicule before 30,000 spectators. I so admire their resolve, their courage, and their defiance. Many in the crowd came out of curiosity, and many expected a good laugh. And you know what? They got it on the first tackle. A big roar of laughter went up in the crowd. And my take on this is that it was shock. They'd never seen women do this before. And then the next tackle came. And like the first, it was good and hard. And then the next tackle, good and hard. And then the next tackle, all consistently good and hard. And within five minutes of play, the rugby girls had won over the crowd. The newspaper said the jeers changed to cheers and the crowd settled down and into the match. And this is what they saw straight from the match reports. The scrums packed down faultlessly. The tackles were good and hard. The hooking of both rakes clever. The passing rushes quite up to the standard of many first grade matches. And I could go on. And this too was a first almost universally glowing match reports for a game of women's football. And as the first half progressed, the game only got more exciting. And now for the third thing this story offers. And to do this, we're going to move to the halftime break. Rugby League's most revered pioneer player, Delhi Messenger, yes, the man whose name is on the medal, enters the arena to perform a goal-kicking exhibition with his new Delhi M match football. And in doing so, defies a ban by the body that he played no small role in founding the New South Wales Rugby League, who said to their most famous player, if you perform at this match, we'll put a ban on you. And he was instructed to instead launch his ball at a rival carnival his old club, East, was hosting next door. But he said, nah, I'm going with the women. And, and Messenger wasn't the only male ally to the women. Playing. A match of this scale could not have happened without many men as allies to the women, and this included their trainers, the male curtain raiser teams who also defied the ban, the showground trustees, the promoter, male family members, and many in the male dominated sports press. And I think this is another space that this story opens up an historical place for men who have been allies to women in their quest to play rugby league. And this is not to negate by any means the opposition women have faced by men, but we need to normalise that there is this other history as well so we can continue to grow this space into the future. Okay, and the last thing this match offers, its first star, Maggie Maloney. And can I just acknowledge Tracy Gorman sitting down the front, Maggie Maloney's granddaughter, who's here tonight. Maggie was only 15 at the time. She was the youngest and lightest member of the two teams. But she knew she was athletically gifted before this match. She loved rugby league. Her older brother had played for South Sydney. Um, but she had to sort of content herself with scratch matches with the neighbourhood kids. So when a women's rugby league was first mooted, her words to her mum were, Oh, mum, I'm set. I'm off. She really wanted to play this game. But when it came to the match, she was actually a slow starter. Perhaps a typical teenager, she left her garters in the dressing room and she actually spent the first 10, 15 minutes pulling up her socks. I, I would think maybe a bit of nerves and maybe even a little bit of self-consciousness in that period about showing her calves. But then the moment came where she didn't have time to think. The ball came out to her from a scrum. 
And as the newspaper said, it was shut the gate. She took off like a deer. She was really fast, but only to be solidly grounded by her opponent, who we only know as Elle Lewin. And Elle Lewin really kept the pressure on Maggie the whole match. The newspaper said theirs was a wonderful jewel. And this is the thing. Maggie had to work for her tries, and that's what made her exciting. If it had been a romp in the park for her, it would not have had the same effect. But because she had, a, had to work hard, she got a chance to really show what she could do, that she could swerve and sidestep at great speed. She was a winger. That she knew how to cut in, and that she had a sound knowledge, as they put it, of the science of the game. Her second try, just before half time, was a regular beauty, straight from the newspaper. She had to first shake off the forwards, then outpace her opponent, and finally swerve past the fullback. She did it like a champion. In fact, by the second half, something magical had happened. The crowd had learnt that her first name was Maggie, because it didn't say that on the match program. And whenever she got the ball, the crowd all around the enclosure would yell, Go, Maggie, go. When she scored her final try in the last moments of the second half, the barracking was apparently deafening, as loud as any league final. And I think this is what makes Maggie a star. She took an already good match to the next level, and that's what our stars do. And I think, in terms of the debate around whether the Dalian medal for women should be renamed, I think there's some special things that link Maggie Maloney and Deli Messenger, Maggie M and Deli M. And I think that they both had that special X factor of magic, which I distill down to two things, awe and joy. They both had the capacity to inspire a sense of collective awe and joy in those who watched them played. And like, let's face it, that's why we go to the football, in the hope that we will have this collective experience. It's the very currency of sport. And Maggie was the first woman in the game to achieve this, and that is very special. Now, when it comes to the medal debate, whose ever name is on the medal, it has to have meaning to the women who play the game today and the young girls coming through. And it must be a name that can endure. And one thing I learned during the mural is that Maggie's story is still able to inspire that sense of magic and joy that she did in 1921. Like, people just love her story. And there's another aspect to Maggie's story, and it's a bit sadder. When the Ladies' League disbanded in 1923, there was just too much opposition. She was absolutely brokenhearted. And I think we have to recognise that this is also part of the history of the women's game. How many Maggie Maloney's have been lost over the last century? Young, talented women who knew they could play the game, who loved the game, who could, like Maggie, have inspired awe and joy in people who watched them, and they've been lost. And I think we have to recognise that that real human pain is also part of the history of the women's game. And I think in terms of Maggie's pain, we connect with it because she had both. She had the joy and then she had the heartache. So to wrap this up, I think that the memory of these four things, and I could talk about others with regards to the 1921 pioneers, that they had, uh, there's a hundred year old vision behind the women's game, that the, the inspiration and pride that we can feel in their achievements that their story creates a historical place for male allies, and then the joy and heartache of the women's game first star. I think by bringing these, this story out, I think, and keeping it alive, it will actually add just another little layer of protection against women having to pioneer their sport over and over again. And I think those days are actually gone. The next pioneering efforts are building it to the next level. And in that, I hope that their story can just add a little bit of fire to their resolve. And I know there's already a lot of fire in the women's game. They wouldn't have got this far without that fire. But I hope this story can add a little bit more fire to their resolve as they continue to build and grow their game until one day they can say, we have achieved not only our own vision, but the vision of our very first pioneers. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Kath. Uh, although that brief flowering in 1921 didn't take root, it's a window into a subculture uh, because there's always been girls and women wanting to play the game and relishing any opportunity. But after Whitlam, and by the 1980s and 90s, the position, position of women in Australian society had changed. There had been a sexual and social revolution that influenced every part of society and empowered women everywhere. And rugby league was no different. So here we are in 2022, the Women's National Rugby League Premiership has established firm roots and is expanding rapidly with six current clubs and another four joining next year and others lining up. The representative structure has expanded to include an origin rivalry that commands its own space, an international football with a really exciting Rugby League World Cup about to commence for the ladies. In fact, we asked a couple of Roos to come along tonight, but they've gone into camp this very evening. The women's game is in rude good health, but there are still strengths and weaknesses, threats and opportunities awaiting. To help, help us examine all this and more, please welcome our two guests for tonight, the doyen of Australian journalist Tracy Holmes and one of the pioneering ladies of rugby league, Miss Tasha Gale. Please make them welcome as they join me on the stage. Yeah, so from the start, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for inviting me. And of course, I also pay my respects to the traditional owners, uh, the Gadigal people, the Viora Nation. And um, I also said to Tasha that I, I really do have to take a back seat here. So I'm just a journo, right? These are the stars. Um, we did hope to have someone else with us tonight, but unfortunately uh, she had uh, an issue with her baby and that's fully understandable. But like, this is really your night. It's the night of women in rugby league and um, you're a real legend of that. So you just take over and talk over the top of me anytime you like. <laughs> Thanks, Trace. Um, in response to your question, um, I, I firstly have to recognise Catherine and that speech. I'm not sure if uh, you guys noticed, but I was awestruck by the, the history. I mean, I knew the history of uh, Maggie Maloney, but to have it put so eloquently and those words that were used, you know, um, joy and awe, um, which is the currency of our great game. Catherine put that so very well that as she actually left the stage, I grabbed her and said, Ma, please have a copy of that speech because it's those elements in that that are the history of our great game that I wish to continue and promote. And, and um, I'm a high school teacher, PE teacher, certainly not an English teacher, and um, to have someone like Catherine put that together, it was just amazing and and I hope to be able to quote her in the future. So can we just put your hands together one more time for Catherine? I think one of the other important things is, um, like Catherine said, you know, women can't do things without the support of men. And uh, I was really interested when you told me the topic of this evening and that this is what we were celebrating, you know, women in league. and. The, the great stories of the past and where it's come and where we are at the moment and what the future looks like. And I thought, well, that'll be interesting because in times gone by, when the topic was about women in sport, none of the men would show up. It would be a 100% female room. So uh, I actually would like to um, ask all of the men to give yourselves a round of applause too because thank you for your support. <laughs> thank you for coming. <laughs> We do it often enough anyway, Trace, give ourselves enough <laughs> yeah. applause, don't worry, so I'm told. Um, but how have we come so far then since the, um, the days when the Maggie Maloney's uh, wanted to play the game? And what's changed in rugby league and in Australia? I think definitely um, the support of the men, um, and that's vital to the growth of, of our great game. Uh, the very first, um, it was a informal Australian team, so it's not recognised. The inaugural Australian team was in 1995, but in 1993, there was a man called um, Ian Davies, and he was the coach of the North Sydney women. And he started that push to get the Women's Rugby League recognised. Now, I started playing in 1995, and looking around, there's not many people out there as old as myself, but you may well recognise or remember that um, in, uh, 96 and 97 we had this Super League war and that's when women's rugby league was really taking off 
um, from 95 were playing test matches and, and touring every single year, but we could not get that affiliation with the men's governing body because of the Super League war. But then in 1998, with the help of a great man, Ian Davies, whom I mentioned earlier, um, and Laurel Savage, uh, and Veronica White, there's a medal named after her uh, presently, uh, we became affiliated. And once we became affiliated with the men's governing body, that's when things really took off. And so that was a big game changer for us. It, it, that sort of replicates the story a bit of the um, Indigenous knockout, which is again one of the great success stories of the last 50 years, but it was initially done outside the system, and it's only because of the hard work that they did to make it a success that in the end, the two bodies, it had to become an official part of the game, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. There's the Koori knockout, and there's the Indigenous All-Stars. Mm -hmm. And that is just an incredible start to the Rugby League calendar year. Um, if, if you haven't watched one of those games, then you really, really truly should. And, and, and those of you that haven't watched a lot of the Women's Rugby League, there was a co-captain there, uh, Caitlin Johnson, and she's had a barnstorming year, and she's now making her debut for Australia at the World Cup. And that all began from this incredible start to the year. Uh, I think she's only like 20 years of age. I watched her um, playing in the junior competitions, um, and she's come through a proud Aboriginal woman and now is playing for Australia, and rightly so. So, Caitlin Johnson, keep your ear out for her. I think the other really important thing is um, it, it's the media. And once you start commanding the attention of the media and you start being, you know, having broadcast minutes or hours and you have people writing columns about you and people creating a sense of um, superstars like Maggie Maloney, uh, that's when it gives people a hook to tap into and they want to follow week in, week out. What's going to happen with her? How is she going to play next week? What's going to happen to the competition? When are we going to have the same number of women's teams as men's teams? And the, the media really helps drive that. And I know for a long time, there was a real struggle in the women were playing. Um, and aside from that anomaly with uh, that incredible match 101 years ago, uh, you were playing, putting in the effort, but not getting the recognition. And without the recognition, you can't get the sponsorship. Without the sponsorship, you can't get the, the minutes and, and the afternoons to, to train and be better and have the facilities you need and all of the equipment that you need. So that all plays into it as well. So is that just a maturing nation or a maturing media or part of a global phenomenon or um, that, that, that respect is now accorded? I think what happened was the women just said that's enough <laughs> and um, step up, you know, governing body, step up, media, step up. Uh, and, and basically held them to account. And this is what happens. And I think it's interesting that you brought up about, uh, you know, Indigenous football as well and, and First Nations people because, I mean, they still have a struggle also in going from absolute superstars of the game. Where are all the coaches? They, they can't get a gig anywhere. And so you know where they've gone? They've gone to the women's game. I think three of the current coaches in the women's game are, are um, male, Indigenous male players, former. And, Including um, former um, Tom Brock, uh, lecturer, Dean Winners. Yep, exactly. That's exactly right. So, so th you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that groups that are kind of sidelined end up turning to each other for that sort of support and in greater strength and greater numbers, they can help pivot it forward. Absolutely. I think being... Um Back in 1995, both of my brothers uh, played first grade rugby league and I grew up always, you know, you couldn't get off the lounge without being tackled. You couldn't go to the toilet without being tackled. So if I, if I would... Brett. Scott didn't do much tackling. <laughs> you know what, Brett will love to hear that. I'm gonna have to say, tell him that. Um, but yeah, like, so to in, in order to be included with the boys, I had to learn how to tackle. And then I remember as a little and watching my brothers uh, play, and I just said to mum, why can't I play? And she said, because you can't, darling. And to which Scott, as you mentioned, you know, shrug off, sidestep, left, right, under the post. And I went, I stopped him from scoring this morning. I can play. 
And so it just took the, the, so many years to put and realise that um, there were barriers to our great game for, for women playing, um, but not just financial barriers. There were the social barriers. And I'm proud to say that I, I played with a bunch of women and we were in the minority, um, which only makes you stronger. Um, and instead of those barriers, they'd come up. And instead of like turning your back and walking in the other direction, you know, these women didn't just see these barriers and try and run around them. They didn't even try to climb over them. They ran proudly through them. And I think that is a major step to where our game is today. So in 2022 then, what are the best things of the current situation for the Women's Rugby League? Coverage, <laughs> uh, which helps drive sponsorship, which helps make the competition better. Um, and, and not just that, but normalising it. It's now normal to see women playing rugby league. And so that's always the hardest thing, isn't it? When people first tune in or, or the first people when they saw the first moments of that game 101 years ago and sort of laugh when the first tackle was made, um, like, like a group of ignorant people. People aren't ignorant anymore because you see the game and everybody knows there's NRLW. Everybody knows women play rugby league. And so that makes it normal. And the great thing about that is that when you normalise something, it's not just the girls that are going to be encouraged by seeing the women play, but young boys too grow up in a situation where they see women doing the same thing as the men. There's an elite competition of women and men. They appreciate that there's this equality that didn't exist previously. And, and I think that's a huge step. Yeah, most definitely. Catherine made the, the great point that um, you've got trailblazers in our game. And um, Maggie, um, over 100 years ago, Maggie Maloney, was one of those trailblazers. But then it took a while. The league failed in, in 1923. And then it took a while. It was the 1990s before myself and my um, other players, uh, again, we had to be trailblazers. But then if you look at the NRLW, they are trailblazers once again. But I think we've made that hurdle. I think that, um, as Catherine wisely said, that uh, jeer for the first tackle to a cheer is a, a monumental step. And um, I think that NRLW over the last few years has really finally got over that hurdle that we don't have to you know, reinvent and, and become pioneers every single year. I think we've, we've made a, a, a remarkable step and it's definitely a sustainable step. By not going too big too quickly, we have the male and female audience seeing very, very skillful and talented women. And I, I've always said that uh, growth of a sport from little things, big things grow. And it's not about width, it's about depth. And the um, NRLW and the junior competitions that are coming through, it's giving us that depth. So it's ensuring that rugby league, you don't have your fringe players that are, you know, not to the quality. You have the quality right across every single team because we've made sustainable steps. So yeah, I'm really proud of it. Do you think there's more work to be done though on pathways, um, particularly with juniors and schools? Yeah, certainly. We've got, um, well actually this year, we had our first uh, Australian schoolgirls team. Mm. And it was, it was amazing that um, the boys were celebrating their 50 years of Australian schoolboys teams. Both my brothers made the Australian mm. schoolboys team. There was nothing for me. And yet, I'm, I might look very young, but I'm actually <laughs> 56. And finally, they have an Australian schoolgirls team. So yes, there still are a lot of um, things that need to be done. And I'm proud to say that New South Wales have really got a very good pathway system. And um, at the moment, it's better than Queensland. That's why we can nail them in the state of origin. Um, but yeah, look, I'm, there are still definitely steps to be taken. We've come so far, but there is still a long way to go. 
And I think that's one of the challenges um, that, that sport is facing. And you don't want to sort of put all of the focus on the elite and, and think that things are just going to happen. You know, it really requires investment at that grassroots level. And this is something that um, all sports are, are now wrestling with. You know, when you, when you get money, where does the money go? How much of it goes to the elite? How much of it goes to grassroots? And many people think many different things. Some people think, you know, you, you just pay for the top and it's gonna motivate all of the young ones to come through and pick your sport over any other sport. I think trickle, trickle down economics trickle down has actually yeah. been yeah. We're, we're proven it doesn't work, right? Exactly, but there's a lot of sports <laughs> that still think that. Um, and, and then the other one is that, you know, you look after the grassroots and, and you can build towards the top. But the reality is, you have to somehow find a way of having both and how you get, you know, whatever the, the portion is. And sometimes it might fluctuate, it might change. Uh, but we're at that sort of period now where rugby league needs to start wrestling with those sorts of challenges to make sure that growth continues and that pathways exist and um, that the game flourishes overall and, and in the end then becomes self-sustaining. Uh, because it will pay for itself. And more than that, it will bring in more money that can be reinvested or spent elsewhere. Um, okay, well, I've had a list of issues that we go through here. Expansion was obviously one of them, and Pathways taps into that. But um, it, I think it also shows the importance of the touch and tag formats as an introduction to the game, particularly for some of the, the girls and that involved. Um, but you look around at the Koori Knockout, for example, the number of girls and women's teams who participate in that at, from across New South Wales, it's incredible. The, uh, at all age groups, um, they, yeah. they have not just the, the, the open age, um, but the girls along the pathways as well. So they're lining up to play, given the opportunity, aren't they? Yeah, and do you know what? I, I think rugby league is in a unique situation where it can actually lead in, in twin spaces. And some would argue that in the um, First Nations space, it already does. When you look at the challenges that other sports are facing and how they don't deal with this aspect very well at all, and yet completely rely on their superstars who are First Nations people, rugby league is different. And, and I think um, that is something that is a, a real advantage across the men's and the women's game. And it's something that, that rugby league, those in charge, should really capitalise on and, and really focus on because it's way ahead of pretty much every other sport in this country. Yeah, look, m most definitely, Trace, I agree. Um, I spoke to the head of uh, competitions for New South Wales today. Um, I also spoke to somebody from the NRL and they both assured me that women's registrations and participations are actually the biggest growth area um, of rugby league. And, you know, Peter Volandis, the man of golden feathers, he's, he's got that business mind, hasn't he, guys? Like, he's got that, and so he knows, and eyes on, you know, you look at the commercial rights with the Fox and with the Channel 9, and it's all about eyes on. Um, and to have that growth being the largest growth area of the NRL, being female participation, shows that the future is looking bright, but we need to continue to nurture it. Um, there are obviously a, a number of issues that affect the game and the women's game as well. Concussion is a big talking point in every sport these days and impacts on rugby league, obviously, by the very nature of the, the combative nature of the game. Um, how do women How's the women's game going to address that, do you think? Well, I think it's um, not just a female issue. No, I think so. it's yeah. um, a people issue. Yeah. Um, because we've all got the same, you know, male or female. Females might have the better brain, so maybe more susceptible to, to damage. But... Um, You've got more brain cells to lose. <laughs> so I hear... Yes, we um, know. Thank you. But, this isn't being recorded, is it? <laughs> So, yes, it is very important, and you see a lot of the women, um, actually not a lot, but there are the ones, and as a Fox commentator, I like the ones that wear headgear because it's easier to recognise them <laughs> on the field when you can't see their numbers. But, yes, it is an issue, and I think rugby league are leading the way with their concussion protocols, with how very, very strict they are. You know, you don't have the trainer going out there 
I mean, back when I was playing, we used to self-diagnose and go, yeah, we're okay. But now they've realised the damage that can occur with head clashes, with uh, the crusher tackle. Um, so I think rugby league are very much aware of that. And as far as I think they're leading the way in combating that. And it's a very different issue back in 1995 when I first started playing. I, the question I always got from, you know, uh, people or reporters or whatever, it was, um, don't your boobs hurt, you know, when you get tackled? And I just thought, wow, that's, you know, we've got to progress the, the punter's knowledge of what's going on because um, that's not the main issue. Like, men are tackled from the hip to the knees and I, I believe they've got a very sensitive area somewhere in between <laughs> there. So, you know, it was amazing that they're asking me about my boobs and so... Um, yeah, but concussion is definitely an issue and, and I know they're doing lots of studies into that and the, the HIA protocols are certainly in full force. Um, social media is also a, a challenge and a threat and an opportunity, I suppose, in many ways. And we saw uh, recently with the passing of the Queen, one of the Newcastle players, Caitlin Moran, wasn't it, uh, made a, a social media post and got in all sorts of problems. And then it was actually funny that the Rugby League Players Association came out strongly behind um, her and said, why are you hitting her so hard when you're letting other guys serve suspensions next year um, and you're taking up one sixth, I think it was, of her salary for the year? Yeah, well, can I just say, I think it was 25% of her salary yeah, exactly. and it was, a, you know, suspended and it wasn't taken straight away, but a room full of uh, people who were very interested in historical facts. Um, was that the biggest fine ever handed down in rugby league history, 25% of a salary? Does anyone know of one bigger? No. Absolutely not. That's appalling. Yes. And, you know, I think it was Ray Hadley that said it's the most disgusting thing that's ever happened in rugby league. Well, sorry, Ray. Uh, there's a in few the last other week things. He means yeah. he's every week <laughs> <to> <laughs> um, and, and again, it sort of raises uh, that, you know, this shows that there's still some way to go, isn't there, in the way that we look at this, that we are going to view the women who play it and the women's game differently to how we judge the men who play it and the men's game. And I was in a conversation recently, um, and I can't give you all the details because it was supposed to be a private conversation, but it was really interesting when somebody said, you know, what, what are the biggest issues that affect the game of rugby league when it comes to men's behaviour? And the men in the room said, oh, gambling, it's the worst. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because I would think sexual assault <laughs> mm. is probably worse than that. But it's just still viewed and measured so differently. And I think those are where the, the discussions between men and women and with men and women in the same room together can try and address some of those things. Because what we see sometimes is clearly not what a lot of the men see. Well, since you've raised the elephant in the room, uh, Tracy, about sexuality, um, you saw the fiasco with the Manly players earlier this year with their response to the Pride jersey and the whole issue of sexuality in the men's game. Um, it's like Ian Roberts was just some sort of freak of nature and um, anyone else who um, would pretend to be gay or in hint that they're gay is going to be almost ostracised. Women's sport has had to deal with the issue and has dealt with it in a far less complicated way for many, many years. What's the difference? I can't see what, what the... Uh, why it's such a big issue for them and why when it's not for women? Well, um, this might come back to the whole brain matter and, you know, when you're talking <laughs> about concussion and stuff like that. I think um, traditionally women have been far more accepting the whole way through of uh, other people and their sexual preferences, no matter what they are. Um, men have gone out to prove... Uh, you know, that they're above other people and, and stronger and, and they think that those sorts of discussions or those sorts of relationships might challenge their masculinity when that is just not true. I mean, look at Ian Roberts, you know, who would challenge his masculinity um, and the way he played the game. Uh, and so I think women have just been far more accepting. Um, and I think we need to get to a point in society where actually it doesn't matter what your sexual preferences are. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's actually got nothing to do with, with playing the game or being a member of society or, or any other thing. It's just a part of, of who you are, and we're all different. Yeah, I think I've got to echo 
um, Tracy's views on that, is that it's not a big deal in the women's game, your sexuality. It is, it's not in the top list of 10. It's how you tackle, how you play, how you pass, how you present yourself. But with the men's game, it obviously is an issue. And I had a bit of a discussion back and forth with my older brother, Brett Gale, and um, I'm, I'm saying about the pride jersey. I said, mate, it's important. And he goes, you know, like, well, Ian Roberts came out and I said, how long ago was that? And do you honestly think that there aren't men in our great game that are hiding their sexuality? There's a reason for that. Whereas the women, it's not even an issue. Um, it's not a question asked, but uh, Ian Day Davis was like a trailblazer because he came out. And why has nobody else since then? That, that's a big issue, and that's a big issue that the men's game do need to address. I'm not saying that Desi Hasler did it in the best way because look where he is now. Um, but, yeah, I think the Pride jersey does have a place. I think every minority group in Australia needs to be heard um, until there is no reason for their voices to be heard because it is, as Tracy said, it's not a big deal in the women's game. But and it is in the men. Just to add to that as well, um, you know, one of those groups that is becoming a minority group in Australia is also um, the, the religious group. And, you know, you say the religious group, the same as you say the LGBTQI group, like everyone's just one thing, but they're not. People are complex, everyone is complex and we all choose different things. We have to recognise that a majority of the players, um, especially in the men's game, uh, are of Pacifica heritage and they come from a very different cultural background. And so even those players who individually might think something, they're under great pressure from the culture that they come from to represent something else. And so at the same time that we have these discussions around LGBTQI, you have to include those people who come from cultures of a religious background. And I think that was the problem with Manly. A decision was made without consulting the players at all. And the whole saga could have been avoided. Maybe it couldn't have, but I think it could have been avoided when you have all of those voices at the table to discuss how you're going to address something. And unfortunately, um, that failed in that regard. A bit like uh, Roy Orbison said, communication breakdown. So um, just to finish up with, before we take some questions from the floor, um, women's sport is on the rise. Uh, across the globe and girl power is nascent everywhere. Um, there's, we had 80,000 people at the um, Women's World Cup final a few years ago and the, 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 the path for both sports and for all women's sport just seems to be onward and upward. Um, and there's a great momentum there. Where to for the future then, on and off the field for the women's game? For both of you. Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, Definitely, I know there's a big push for the State of Origin to go to three games. Um, it's going to two games um, next year. Um, personally, Let's change I want that now. Can everyone write to the NRL yes, and say, please. No, sorry, two games? They can afford it. You yeah. know, three games now, know. thank you. Yeah. It, it is insane to go to two games. Um, the future of women's like and the NRLW has to be eventually every club having a team but not doing that too quickly. We have to have the girls like Izzy Kelly, Kezi Apps, Ali Brigginshaw. The strain that's put on their bodies is amazing. They have to play their state league and um, last year the state league, the Harvey Norman Women's Premiership in Sydney was 15 rounds before you get to the finals. Then the girls are expected to play an NRLW. In the middle of that, they're expected to play um, State of Origin. And then at the end of that, like this year, there's a World Cup. So fabulous that there's that many opportunities to, for the girls to display their wares. But I don't think the average punter knows just how much the girls are, their bodies are being put through 
whilst they're not full-time professional athletes. I saw the, on one of the footy show earlier this year when they were talking to one of the girls and talking about the upcoming end of season comp tournament that was taking place and they said, and she said, yeah, it's her fourth pre-season this year she's been doing the training for. Yeah, 100%, and, and it's not only that, it's the pre-season you've got to go through, it's getting used to your fourth coach that year um, and it's signing four different contracts. So if you play in the Harvey Norman and you get injured, you miss out on state of origin, no contract for you, no money for you. You miss out on the NRLW, same deal. You miss out on the World Cup. So the future of Women's Rugby League needs to be yearly contracts with all health benefits included. Um, look, we haven't got all night, but I could go on with a lot of things. Even maternity leave, that needs to be paid in, in the game. And we've seen Sammy Bremner and a lot of the athletes bounce back after having their kids. Yeah. but. You know, back in my day, that, that was definitely not possible, so we're definitely growing it, but we want one con contract for our female players, and we want all the health benefits along with it. And we want them to be professional athletes, to be able to train twice a day, not have to work during the day and then go uh, train at a field at night. You know, that's one of the things I noticed at FanFest in Martin Place, ahead of the grand finals. And so you had the, the teams introduced to the crowd and that was wonderful. And when it came time to introduce the women's teams, um, every second player was not there. Her name was read out, but she wasn't there because she was at work that day. Uh, and, and so that goes to your point, because if you are trying to work because you're not paid enough to be able to play the game and train and then turn up, your body's wearing down, you don't have adequate time and resources and recovery and all of those things, so expect the physicalness of the game to get better, but we're not providing uh, those options for them. And by doing that and by investing in that, that is when the competition gets better. That's when more eyeballs come, more sponsorship comes, and it will start paying its own way. Too semi and not enough, not professional enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the time will come, I'm predicting, uh, <laughs> I don't know when, no. but I am predicting that in the end, you're going to have men and women doing every job and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll interlace between men's and women's games. And, you know, the best game of the round on Friday night or whenever it is might end up being a women's match that particular Friday. Like, that's where it's going to go because that's the world. Um, so it is going to take um, some time and some vision and some foresight and some real effort on the part of the governing bodies uh, to make that happen, but seriously, like, why not? Yeah. Well, uh, Tasha, you used the word growth. Tracy, you just used the word vision. I think they've been two of the keys out of tonight's discussion. Would you please join me in thanking our elite guests for being fantastic as they knew they would be. Um, we can all step down now. So, um, John Clark's going to get up and do a, a farewell.